land of the lotus eaters, cave of the cyclops, islands of the s**ts, the monster Scylla, the whirlpool called Charybdis, names that still work their ancient on new generations, they on as power symbols. But perhaps the Odyssey is, for many serious scholars, it is a living clue to a living past. They believe Ulysses was a real man, on a real journey, to real places. But they could only guess, speculate from their desks, until British historian Warrer Ernley Bradford put this theory to the test. Searched the Mediterranean, the very ends the Odyssey describes. His clues, the exact words of Homer. His findings were published in a book called Ulysses Found, which classical scholars throughout the world now accept as solid evidence. But Bradford's startling theory needed visual documentation. CBS News producer Martin Carr and a camera crew joined with Bradford in an attempt to verify his theory on film, to match the description in Homer with the places Bradford found. Has this 3,000-year-old mystery finally been solved? This is the search to trace the root of Ulysses, a search behind the myth for the real journey of a real man. wind joined to force me off my course, those accursed winds chased me across the fish and seas. The search for Ulysses stretches across the entire Mediterranean, for these are the waters Ulysses sailed and Homer describes in all their changing moods, their storms and winds, waves and currents. The sea itself holds important clues in the search for Ulysses. To follow them, one needs an intimate knowledge of the Mediterranean, of the ancient lands that border it, and the islands that punctuate its surface. Ernley Bradford came to this quest with the necessary credentials, a scholar's knowledge of classical literature and language, and a sailor's deep understanding of this particular sea. My search for Ulysses began during the Second World War. I was just 19 and a seaman in the Royal Navy. Before I sailed for the first time, a friend gave me a copy of Homer's Odyssey. And in the years that followed, I took it with me from ship to ship. Now when a sailor talks about his voyages, they always seem to get a little bit bigger than life. The fog a little bit thicker, the seas larger, the girls prettier. But so much of Homer's Odyssey has an enormous ring of truth that each time I've sailed these seas, in my twenties, my thirties, and now again in my forties, about the same age, in fact, as Ulysses, the Odyssey reads less like a legend and more like accurate reporting. Homer had to be describing a world I could see and explore and pinpoint on a map of the Mediterranean. I had to find the actual land of the Lotus Eaters, the Cyclops Cave that overlooked the sea, Aeolia, the island of the King of the Winds, the cliffs of the giant Lystraganians, the islands of Circe, the Sirens, Scylla, Charybdis, the Sun God, Calypso, and the Phaeacians. But I had to start with what I did know, that the Greek island of Ithaca, Ulysses' home, is still named Ithaca today. And one other solid piece of evidence, discovered on the Turkish coast, the actual ruins of Troy. The scene of the Trojan War. Ten years of battle. All that remained were piles of stone. 
Homer told the story of the Trojan War in the Iliad, and generations of historians insisted it was poetic invention. But a German businessman named Heinrich Schliemann took Homer literally. In 1876, using the Iliad as a guide, he dug where Homer told him to dig, and he found what Homer told him he would find, the ruins of Troy. If the Iliad is true, isn't it likely that the Odyssey also can be true? The Odyssey begins at the end of the Trojan War, when its hero, Ulysses, sails for home. Though men have argued endlessly about Ulysses' voyage, there's little argument about the beginning of it. Now that we've found the real Troy on the west coast of Turkey, we know the direction Ulysses would have to sail to get home, down the coast of Greece, rounding the southern Cape, and heading north for home, his island of Ithaca. It should have been a short trip. 500 miles should have taken about 10 days. But Ulysses, for all his longing for his wife and home, was starting a journey that would last not 10 days, but 10 years. Homer is precise in telling us what happened. We hauled up the white sails, relying on the wind and the helmsman to keep the vessel straight. I should have reached my own land. But as I was rounding Cape Malaya, the swell, the current, and the north wind joined to force me off my course and push me past the southern tip of Cythera. For nine days, those accursed winds chased me across the fish-infested seas. And they watched the fading shores of southern Greece. I know only too well the north wind and the sea that Homer talks about here. It may seem just poetry to an expert in classical Greek who's never left his desk, but travel just once on the open seas in a small boat, and you'll begin to understand the Odyssey, and begin to understand Ulysses. He was the first man to sail these seas south of Greece. Before him, they were unknown, but like Columbus and all the other explorers to follow, Ulysses was challenged by the adventure of the unknown. There were 12 boats in Ulysses' squadron, all of similar construction, built of wood, black with blue top sides, an oculus or eye painted on the bow, a square sail, probably of linen, a hand paddle in place of a rudder, well-bladed oars, and 40 men, a double complement to pull them. Under all, the ship would make a top speed of four knots, under sail, six knots or more. Over the nine days, Homer says, Ulysses drifted. The Odyssey describes a wind familiar south of Greece, the Levanter, which pushed the boats for nine days in a southwesterly direction. Averaging about three knots, in nine days they'd cover 648 miles. 650 miles down this route lies land, Gerba, an island off the coast of Tunisia. If Ulysses drifted in this direction for nine days, he'd have to reach Gerber on the 10th, which agrees perfectly with Homer's words. On the 10th day, we came to the land of the Lotus Eaters. How welcome this land must have seemed after long days on an unknown sea. Hallucination? The Encyclopedia Britannica says it must have been. It says that the land of the Lotus Eaters isn't a real place. To me, it couldn't be more real. Gerba is an empty, timeless island, 
Everything conceived for centuries about the land of the lotus. The poet Tennyson saw it this way. A land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream. Gerber is this dream, transformed into solid, sun-drenched earth and sky. If, as I think, they rarely landed here, Homer makes it easy to understand its appeal. What sort of land lay beyond the beach? What sort of human beings might live there? I sent some of my followers inland to find out, and it was not long before they were in touch with the lotus eaters. The native Berbers were here before Homer. The name Berber comes from the Greek Barbaros, barbarian. People unable to speak Greek who go bar bar like their animals. The natives were gentle and never thought of harming my men. But they gave them some lotus to taste. And as soon as each man had eaten this honeyed fruit, any thought of leaving this land vanished from his mind. People have maintained that the lotus is a drug. Why not instead a pleasant tasting fruit that can be eaten, as the Odyssey says? There are many choices among Gerber's rare flowers and fruits. But mine is a delicate sweet berry which the natives still eat. It's called the Cordia Mixer. Beyond the fresh fruit and fresh water, Gerber has everything a tired mariner of any century might want. The calm, warm water and warm sand, where the natives walk and work as comfortably as on the land itself. Imagine the appeal of this island for a Greek sailor of Ulysses' time, with everything so different from his harsh, mountainous home. This must have seemed like the peace of a perfect dream. What better dream could come from lotus eating? I was torpedoed near here in the war. Had I not been under orders, I might never have left this island, which demands nothing and gives all. My crew now wished to remain with the Lotus Eaters, to forget they had a home. I had to force them back to the ships. They struck the white surf with their oars and we left that country. Ulysses was far off his course, but he knew that he had to get north. To navigate, he had only the sun and the stars. Ulysses is the first man in recorded history to steer by the stars. But to get north, he would not have steered by the pole star as I would today, for the starry pattern shifts slowly through the centuries. In Homer's time, Polaris, the pole star, would have been 12 degrees away from the pole. He would have steered by Koshab, a bright star only 7 degrees away. A large error in modern terms, but not important for a man in a small, slow boat. Therefore, I deduce his direction from Gerber was 7 degrees to the northeast, and plotting this course on a chart would bring him to four islands off the northwest coast of Sicily. Three are barren and uninviting. Favignana, the fourth, is a beautiful island. Some god must have guided us across the wine-dark sea. It was difficult to see what lay ahead. Approaching from the southwest, Favignana is the first of the four islands one sees. And there's no doubt in my mind that this is the island any sailor would head for. When the fresh dawn came and lit the sky, we found ourselves in a safe harbor with a beach gently washed by the waves. It is a luxuriant island and the home of innumerable goats. 
The goats are wild, for man has made no pathways that might frighten them off. Nor do hunters visit the island, and this land where no man goes makes a happy pasture for the bleating goats. The Odyssey might be describing Favignana today, for Favignana used to be called Igusa, Island of Goats, 2,000 years ago. Ulysses climbs a mountain here and looks across the strait. And all my arguments would fail if today one couldn't climb the mountain and see across the strait Mount Eryx, the setting for Ulysses' next adventure. On the stony heights of Mount Eryx, he meets Polyphemus, who belonged to a race of giants called the Cyclops. Local inhabitants really believe the Cyclops Polyphemus lived up here. To please the tourist, they pick many different caves as his real one. The cave you visit depends on the guide you choose. But the Victorian writer Samuel Butler insisted on one particular cave and made it famous above all others. The energetic curator of the local museum is just as sure. But then he's read Butler's book. The curator misses nothing from the height of the cave to the smallest detail of the Cyclops' story, where he stood blinded, heaving huge boulders at the ship, and, of course, there are huge boulders all over the place. I think the Cyclops was really a large and savage native of Sicily. But to Homer, he was a solitary giant, son of the sea god Poseidon, who tore Ulysses' men apart with his bare hands. To escape took all Ulysses' wiliness. He made Polyphemus drunk, then blinded him with his olive staff. And escaped into the dazzling light where the sea and sky are painful to the eyes. The blinded Cyclops hurled huge pinnacles of rock at the ship and called on his father Poseidon to bring disaster on Ulysses. From his boat, Ulysses jeered up at the blinded giant. Cyclops! If anyone ever asks you how you came by your unsightly blindness, tell him your eye was put out by Ulysses. searching for home, Ulysses would be continuing on a northeasterly course. This would take him to an island Homer says is alone in the sea. For 60 miles northeast of Favignana, there is an island that meets all the requirements. It's now called Ustica. Homer called it Aeolia. The next landfall was the floating island of Aeolia, the home of Aeolus, king of the winds, with power to lay or rouse them each at will. Ustica is the perfect home for the king of the winds. By its unique position, it is exposed to every wind that blows in this region, Scirocco, easterly, westerly. Scholars would only leave their desks and come out here, they would feel this wind and see these clouds and know that this could only be the place. It is from Ustica that Ulysses' voyage must continue and it is from Ustica that I must find his next landfall. But a critical test of my theory was now to begin. For Homer tells us no more than that the seas became suddenly calm 
and Ulysses and his squadron of boats were forced to row for six days. In this time, they would cover 200 to 300 miles, but I had no more facts than this. Except for one unmistakable clue, Homer's precise description of the harbour Ulysses reaches next. A description precise as a mariner's guide. A harbour with two bold headlands and a narrow channel of water between steep cliffs. No harbour in this area looked like this. The clues were fragmentary, yet so specific each port I saw lacked some necessary detail. Nothing we passed was remotely like Homer's description. If it existed, the harbour would be unmistakable. I searched and searched and searched. Finally, I was ready to give up and go home. Until one day, when I was sailing for the first time toward the southern tip of Corsica. The Odyssey wasn't even on my mind until I looked out and there it was in front of me. An excellent harbour closed in on all sides by an unbroken ring of precipitous cliffs. Two bold headlands face each other at the mouth, so as to leave only a narrow channel in between for the ships to enter the sheltered waters. Within 300 miles of Ustica, the harbour Homer describes, the land of the Lystragonians, a race of giants. Corsica, in fact, was inhabited long before Homer, and behind these overwhelming cliffs are the ruins of many huge megalithic burial places. Homer never saw Bonifacio, he must have heard of it. Possibly from a returning sailor, but unlike other sea stories, there's no need to exaggerate here, for Bonifacio would be remarkable in any country. But here, in this tideless sea, where few rivers channel their way from the land, it's truly unique. perfect harbour and the perfect death trap. The light Fregonians ran up from every side. Standing at the top of the cliffs, they pelted my boat with lumps of rock such as a man could barely lift. The groans of the dying men that rose from the ships was appalling. I yelled to my crew to pull with their oars, and we left those frowning cliffs behind and made for the sea. My ship was safe, but there would be no homecoming nest. Only one ship now, Ulysses' own, to try for Ithaca. From Bonifacio, Ulysses sails east, to a place that this time I've no difficulty finding. For everyone, even the people who live there, for they named it after the goddess Ulysses now meets. In Italian, Cesseo, in English we call her Sassi. Italians claim the island's shape resembles a woman asleep, but Italians are incredibly romantic 
and the myth of Circe is strong. This is the only place where, understandably perhaps, home important to Ulysses. He came for a visit and stayed for a solid year. Coming ashore on the only beach where Ulysses could have landed, modern Italians prove that the myth of Circe lives on. For Circe was beautiful, but dangerous, with a power over men, capable of turning them to beasts. Even Ulysses needed the help of the gods to resist her spell. The slopes of Mount Circe are covered with flowers and trees as they were in Ulysses' day, and they're crisscrossed by the streams Homer describes as Circe's handmaidens, the daughters of the springs and groves and sacred rivers. If one goes up Mount Circe, one can see that it was once an island, as Homer says. But through the centuries, the endless deposit of silt and sand has joined it to the mainland of Italy. And near this mountain, the strongest link with the myth of Circe. The ruins of the shrine of a powerful goddess. She was named Feronia, which means goddess of wild animals. Feronia, like Circe, turned men to beasts, keeping them captive in her elaborate palace. Ferenia and Circe, different names, but both representing the same thing, the eternal danger and appeal of a beautiful woman. The mainland of Italy still barred Ulysses' way to the seas of Greece, but Circe gives him the important landmarks to guide him home. First, Circe mentions three rocky islands, strange and unmistakable. Your next encounter will be with the sirens who bewitch all who approach their islands. There is no homecoming for the man who hears their song, for the sirens cast their spell on him. Sailing south from Cape Circeo, these three islands are the logical signpost in the sea for Circe to describe. Most classical writers place the sirens here, I agree, at the entrance to the Bay of Salerno, the Galley Islands. It was, I believe, in the hot, sultry hours of late summer that the sirens sang to Ulysses from the Galley rocks. Myth and tradition say that they loved heat and stillness. Drive your ship past the spot, and to prevent your crew from hearing, soften some beeswax and plug their ears. But if you wish to listen yourself, make them bind you to the mast. If you are meant to release you, they must add to the bonds that already hold you. I think I once heard the siren song, or imagined it. During the war, after a battle near Salerno, I heard what sounded like singing, low, distant, reminiscent of wave and wind, but about it a human quality. We came as close as we dared to the rocks, stopped the engines, nothing. Then it began again. No man's voice could have made that low, sweet sound. This was after the tension of battle, and yet I knew much less about Ulysses then, or even thought he might have sailed this way. The siren's song is unchanging, the forbidden song of infinite knowledge. 
The ancients thought the sirens were bird-like, fierce, predatory harpies. But for the Victorians, the limitless knowledge the sirens offered took quite another form. From the Galley Islands to the Messina Strait, 150 miles, the terror of the strait now lay ahead. The impossible choice, Charybdis on one side, the rock of Scylla on the other. On this crag there is a misty cavern, the home of Scylla, a horrible monster, ferocious and impossible to fight. No crew has ever sailed past Scylla without loss. I swung my ship round and ran my eye over the crew. My men turned pale with fear, and Scylla snatched from my boat the six ablest men I had on board. In describing Scylla's rock, Homer is indulging in poetic exaggeration. To me, Scylla frankly looks like a travel poster. But even modern maps and guidebooks bear me out. The fishing village around it, so peaceful and picturesque, still bears the fearsome name of Scylla. In a small boat, the waters here are not as peaceful as they seem. Local fishermen still fear the currents, eddies, shifting tides, and whirlpools. The water seethes like a cauldron on a blazing fire. Dread Charybdis sucks the dark waters down. Three times a day she spews them up in her horrible way. Heaven keep you from the spot, for nothing can save you from disaster. Homer's Charybdis. Is it coincidence that this whirlpool exists today just opposite the rock of Scylla? Local fishermen tell me Charybdis isn't as dangerous as it used to be, but the records say that as late as the 19th century, it was still capable of spinning a 74-gun warship right round. And local fishing boats avoid this spot, still labelled on their charts, Charybdis. The Strait of Messina is one of the world's richest fishing grounds and Homer describes Scylla as a monster who fished from the height of her rock for any of the large sea creatures which in their thousands live in the water below. Scylla, modern style, still roams these seas. For these boats are an ingenious version of the monster. From the height of the tower, the fishermen peer beneath the surface of the water, ready to lunge at any large fish they see below. the fisherman whips his struggling prize to land. Thus Scylla had whisked my comrades up and pulled them struggling from the water.
to escape from Scylla, they rode as fast as possible, making their maximum speed, about four knots, and in six hours reached the only harbour where small boats can safely anchor, Taormina, 24 miles south of Scylla, on the east coast of Sicily. Here Ulysses' boat could draw up on the sandy beach Homer describes. Behind Taormina, Mount Etna. Majestic in a land the Odyssey calls the Kingdom of the Sun God. Here he kept his herds of cattle, bulls, sheep and oxen. Etna's valley is named Val del Bove, Valley of the Ox. And the name Taormina comes from the Greek word for a bull. If you leave these animals untouched and fix your minds on getting home, all of you may yet reach Ithaca. But if you hurt the animals on the sun god's pastures, I swear to you that your ship and your company will be destroyed. This is my choice then for the pastures of the sun god. 350 sacred cattle and 350 sheep. The number of days and nights in the lunar year. The cattle stand for the days and nights of life itself. And by killing them, the Greeks would cut short their own days. Their food ran short. They defied the gods and slaughtered the sacred animals. Zeus brought a cloud over the sun. And the wind blew, Homer says, without pause. A south wind. Then southerlies and easterlies combined. Scirocco weather, this is called. Typical here in autumn. Dangerous weather for sailors. Only one reason Ulysses were put to sea. Fear. His men had offended a god. Zeus brought a somber cloud to rest above the ship so that the sea was darkened by its shadow. A howling wind from the west hit us with hurricane force. Zeus thundered and struck the vessel by lightning. The ship reeled to the blow of his bolts. My men were flung over. There was no homecoming for them. The god saw to that. The storm subsided. Ulysses is now alone, clinging to an improvised raft. He drifts for nine days at the mercy of the current. No wind is mentioned, but he must have floated south because of the southward coastal drift in this area, and finally reaches an island, the home of the goddess Calypso. There's only one island a man drifting south on a raft at one or two knots would reach in nine days, Malta. The Phoenicians called it Marleth, hiding place, and Homer's very phrase is, Island of the Hiding Place. The cliffs that stoop to the sea are pitted with caves. Caves made by Neolithic man and used through the centuries, even as air raid shelters in the Second World War. A cave, in fact, was the dwelling place of the goddess Calypso. And today, many of Malta's inhabitants still seem to prefer the solid comfort and low rent of a cozy cave. And in Malta are the ruins of temples literally carved out of rock. 4,000 years ago, when the huge dimensions of these stone masses dominated the island, the mother goddess was still worshipped here. A goddess similar in fact to Calypso. These 
these temples, built deliberately as caves, wind deep beneath the ground. Perhaps Calypso's cave was very much like this. We can see from statues discovered in these caves, and now in the Malta Museum, what the divine Calypso might have looked like. After sharing the couch of this rather ample goddess for seven years, one can perhaps understand Ulysses' eagerness to get back to his wife. The living proof of the immortality of Calypso crowd the streets of Malta today. days found him sitting on the rocks, torturing himself with tears and groans, and looking out with streaming eyes across the water wilderness. After seven years, Calypso finally allowed Ulysses to build a small boat and leave the island. Calypso showed him the place where the trees were tallest, and Ulysses cut the timber down to build his boat. And it was with a happy heart that Ulysses spread his sail to catch the wind. Ulysses tears an easterly course by following Calypso's advice and keeping the pole star on his left. In the type of boat he's built, he'd average three quarters of a knot and would come within sight of Greece in exactly the 17 days Homer says he took. But close as he was to his island of Ithaca, his boat is destroyed in a storm and he's forced to swim to the nearest island. I believe this island is Corfu. Tremendous waves swept him forward to the rugged shore. He clung to a rock, groaning while the great waves marched by. But no sooner had he escaped than another struck him. Freeing himself at last from the coastal breakers, he continued to swim until he reached a smooth watered harbor clear of rocks. This is Ermone's Bay, the loveliest beach on the island of Corfu. Above it, just as Homer tells us, stands a grove of ancient olive trees. Here, the exhausted Ulysses hid himself and fell asleep. A swift, fresh stream still flows below, where the women of Corfu still do their laundering. Homer, poetically, makes the job of laundering seem most attractive. There was always enough clear water bubbling up and swirling by to clean the dirtiest clothes. The women lifted the clothes and dropped them into the water and rubbed them briskly, competing with each other in the work. When they rinsed them till no dirt was left, they spread them out to dry. All over this island there are arguments, not about whether Ulysses came to Corfu, but exactly where he swam ashore, at which stream he stood, watching the island's women doing their wash. This is my choice, but the Greek expert and writer, Lawrence Durrell, chooses another location, and no one cares more about Greek legend or can argue more solidly about Ulysses and Corfu than Durrell. I chose this house 
is because I believe it was the actual spot where Ulysses was washed ashore. Or I know that there's a good deal to be said for Bradford's beach, but this one also fits the story, and I think rather better. It depends, of course, which side of the island you think he swam down. I've tested the tides more than once, using an old raft, and I've always got washed in here. But then, of course, we shall never finally know. And in arguing this way, we only prove how strong a hold the Odyssey has over us. But for me, it'll always be here, this landlocked harbor with its narrow entrance. What a strange configuration of rocks. And then the beach, attractive not only to Ulysses, but to my family. And then, of course, there's the little stream, too, where only last year I actually saw the women washing their linen. And finally, of course, right up behind us, I have found the ruins of a castle which corresponds to the palace of Alcinous, king of the island, who entertained Ulysses and allowed him to tell his whole story at dinner. Yes, the castle clinches the matter for anyone who can face the bone-shaking climb up these precipices. A fantastic place, indeed. Up here, in the silence, you can hear the wing beats of the golden eagle as he slides by beneath you. Bruised thyme and rosemary, they're the only smells. And then, most astonishing of all, we even have the petrified ship which Poseidon turned to stone in his wrath, the ship which took Ulysses home. And indeed, it's called the ship to this day, but it's a perpetual reminder to the sailors of this rocky coast that you can't fool with the sea, even if you are Ulysses. The Odyssey, ten years on the long voyage, traced his journey again, that Ulysses' trip was real, and that he was a real man. Only one small journey now remained, Corfu, to Ithaca, home. With a northerly wind, the boat must have gone smoothly and fast. Just ahead, the familiar hills of his island and the moment of reunion with his waiting wife. Homer knew the meaning of that moment for Ulysses or any man coming home. From his heart to his heart, the ache of his longing mounted. The longing of a sailor who has found his way through the white surf to the far distant shore. Very soon, the sweet moment of opening his arms to hold his wife. Sweet moment, too, for Penelope. She would keep her white arms round his neck and never quite let go. In equating fact with myth, it's important to remember that thousands of years ago, man conceived no limit dividing the real world outside and the inner world of the imagination. In Ulysses' time, the gods spoke out of cave and rock, in the movements of the sea, in the way mists lifted off a mountain, and with a touch of magic, the thin screen between men and gods could be passed the power of the gods is still here, but behind the myth lies the magic of truth. Turn to the story of Ulysses, or come to the seas he sailed, and you too may be caught by this power, and begin a search too, perhaps of a different sort. We all have different journeys to make. This was mine.
The Search for Ulysses was filmed and edited under the supervision and control of CBS News. Thank <laughs> you.